Okay, we are live. Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm State Senator Mary Washington, representing the 43rd Legislative District. Want to welcome all of you to our joint committee on ending homelessness. Uh, this is our second uh, meeting of our joint committee. Uh, this meeting is going to focus on how we can leverage public and private partnerships and how those partnerships can impact our goal to end homelessness. Um, our guests include the Lord Baltimore, a private partner who has made extraordinary strides in reducing homelessness through innovative and collaborative housing solutions. Um, others include Gecko, which has a longstanding history of fighting for housing equity and shelter for our seniors. And also we will hear from United Way Catholic Charities, our Fair Housing Coalition Center of Maryland, Women's Housing Coalition, just to name a few. Um, additionally, we have uh, Elsie Gillipsy from the Baltimore City uh, Office of Performance and Innovation. Um, and then we also hear from um, our partners, uh, Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition, uh, a very, very key, two very, very key partners uh, in making sure that we end homelessness uh, is the Multi-Housing Association, uh, our partners, MACO, and the Maryland Bankers Association. And of course, we'll hear from a Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, so that just gives you a, a kind of a broad view. It's a very robust agenda. There's a lot to cover. So we, this is mostly a briefing. We're going to be hearing from these partners. We're gonna be hearing from these constituent groups. Um, we will have a couple of questions, but much of this is an opportunity for all of us to hear where they are in, in our efforts to end homelessness in the state of Maryland. And also to give our committee some of the ideas and, and additional work that uh, understandings that we need uh, to, to develop our recommendations as we lead up to the legislative session, which is just a few months away. Wow. <laughs> uh, but uh, mostly uh, first, next, I want to make sure I introduce my colleague, uh, my co-chair, uh, Delegate Valentina Smith, who represents the 23rd district and any opening mark remarks that you'd like to say to the committee and to those of us that are listening um, live. No, uh, thank you, Senator Washington. We've got a, a day ahead of us here, which I think is going to be very robust discussion and very helpful in us making recommendations to leadership. For all of us here that have been working together, we know that pre-pandemic, not only our state, but our country was facing an epidemic of housing insecurity. And it's only been exasperated because of the pandemic. So even more important that for the advocates that are presenting today for DHS and MAKO to help use this time so that we understand going into session what we can propose to leadership that can and will make a difference um, for housing and security. So with that, I think we should start. And just have our, just if you maybe you might want to give your colleagues in, in the house an opportunity to introduce themselves really quickly and then, and then yeah, we have Senate. And then Delegate Patterson, why don't you start uh, for the audience where you're from and introduce yourself. Hello all, I'm Delegate Edith Patterson. I represent Charles County District 28. Thank you so much for being here. Delegate McKay. Good afternoon, everyone. Delegate McKay representing both Allegheny and Washington County up here in beautiful Maryland. Looking forward to the information we're going to get today. So thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Um, let's learn a lot today. And I'm not sure if Delegate Krim has been able to join by phone yet. Has she, staff? Um, she should be on. Delegate Krim? Oh, she was on. Okay, well, the other two members, Delegate Krim and Delegate Learman, both Learman's here. Members. Delegate Lehrman's here. Is she Come here? On. Hi, everybody. Okay. Great All to right. be here. Thank you for having me. Look forward to the discussion. And Delegate Krim may be listening, um, also very committed and a longstanding member of this committee from Western Maryland. Awesome. So I'll just start with my last screen that I have here. So I see uh, the good Senator from Annapolis. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Senator Sarah Elfrick representing District 30, Annapolis and Southern Anne Arundel County, just down the street from the State House. Great. And I see the good Senator from Baltimore County, Howard County. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, apologize for joining a few minutes late. My other job here at Hopkins has been all consuming. So just hopped off another Zoom. Happy to be here. Happy to participate in this. Thank you. Great. And the Senator from Charles County. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Arthur Ellis from Charles County, District 28. Looking forward to hearing from all the advocates. Great. Uh, and Senator from my neighbor uh, to the uh, actually surrounding us, uh, Baltimore County. I think it's Senator Sidnor. Oh, I, I wasn't certain if you talk about other. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Senator Sailing, uh, uh, Senator Charles Sidnor, uh, uh, representing District 44, which is Baltimore County as well as Baltimore City. Thank you all. Okay, and also next, Senator S Sailing. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Sailing from Baltimore County, Sixth District. Uh, looking forward to uh, hear all the good information and how much more we can help our homelessness. Thank you. And then I believe we'll end uh, with the uh, Senator from uh, Gorgeous Prince George's. You have to unmute. Hit the space bar, Delegate Senator Benson. Okay. Yes. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Uh, Joanne C. Benson, 24th Legislative District of Prince Georgia County, and I'm very pleased to uh, be a part of this committee because it's so important for all of us to understand that homelessness is unacceptable. And I look forward to hearing uh, the wonderful things that are being done uh, to help those who are who have uh, no hope. We need to give them help and we need to do all we can to provide homes for the least of these. Thank you. Uh, and just let everybody know, so uh, uh, Delegate Valentino Smith and I take turns doing this. So Delegate Valentino Smith, you can uh, kick us off. Okay, um, I think we'll start right away then with our first panelist, which is Lord Baltimore Hotel. We've got Ms. Shimnuik, did I say that right? General Manager of the Lord Baltimore Hotel? Yes. And Ms. Galepsi, Baltimore City Mayor's Office. So we're excited to hear what has been happening there. And in terms of, are there handouts? I do not have any handouts. Okay. It's more of a story. I'll tell you the story. That's okay. what we'd like to hear. Great. So I know we have um, Elise on the other line and she can give you the context um, from the backside. Uh, but um, how, did, how did the Lord Baltimore get involved in such, such a mission? Um, Back in early March, like so many of our hotels in the city, uh, we, we experienced, all the hotels experienced a huge decline in occupancy, a little over 60% uh, drop year over year. Um, that kind of represents, if you think about the huge amount of um, employees that work in restaurants, hotels, bars, you know, that you can see the cascading effect uh, on their livelihoods. Um, what we saw as a hotel community was just about every major piece of business uh, just evaporated, corporate, leisure, transient group. Um, we were fortunate enough, like many hotels, to get some first responder business. Um, and, you know, that representing some National Guard, police, uh, hospital support group, um, uh, and uh, certainly uh, the firemen. So we saw a little of that early in March, but you know, it, the, the landscape just got worse in our, in our business community. Um, so we were all kind of trying, we were all fighting for that same piece of pie and there just really, um, there was, there was uh, layoffs happening. We saw just an incredible shrinking in our culture. Um, so we, uh, we had a really unique opportunity. Um, I've been in the hotel business in Baltimore City for almost 20 years and um, tried when I could to partner with the University of Maryland and with the city of Baltimore on uh, whatever, however that hotel at that time could, could support uh, the city. Um, but we were faced with even, you know, more difficult, you know, more difficult situations. We were thinking about the layoffs and furloughs. You know, my hotel uh, staff shrunk uh, over 50% in a very short amount of time. Um, I was worried about the impact, not just my hotel, but what about the city and the state? Uh, because, you know, in the hotel business, we all kind of partner together. 
my big concern too was will my owners survive this? Um, we are a family owned business and um, it gets, it, it hits home really very quickly when you start to see your revenue streams just evaporate. Um, but with that being a family owned business, they are committed to helping the city navigate uh, through these turbulent times. My owner um, actually uh, came to the United States and she was homeless uh, for the first year or so that she and her family emigrated uh, from Europe. Um, and her message to me early was she really wanted to provide a safe and warm shelter when our residents in the city needed it the most. And then she said to me, she goes, isn't that the underlying mission of hotels? Isn't that the minimum expectation? And when she said that to me at first, you know, um, as a hotelier, uh, I worked many years with Marriott. Uh, this is the first time an owner ever said to me, lean in, reach out and take care of the people around you because some of them could be our employees. So it was pretty clear that where her heart stood on helping the, um, the residents of the city. So to kind of give you just kind of a snapshot and I'll let Elise tell you the, the rest of the backstory. But right now, um, you know, we have, uh, we're supporting COVID residents. We are supporting uh, residents that are in the testing phase for COVID. Um, we have people here who are just here to isolate because they live in congregate living situations or multi-generational households. Um, and more recently, we've taken on the challenge of sheltering those that have um, not stable housing when they leave the hotel. So we've converted uh, four floors for that purpose. So we can accommodate about a hundred um, people who are in need of long-term housing solutions. In that, in that solution, um, just so that you all know, in the short time that we've been doing this, we have served over 19,000 meals. And we've been at this uh, mission only since the beginning, actually the middle of May. Right after Mother's Day, we accepted our first residence. Um, that's three meals a day and a snack, sometimes more, sometimes less. It depends on who's in the house. We find that children are really interested in calling and asking for ice cream. And since we're a, we're a hotel first, always, um, we were delivering ice cream, I swear, by the half gallon. But, uh, but, uh, that was, but that's why we're here, right? Um, we, dis we, we discovered also that food really could be a barrier, you know, if we weren't providing the right quantity, the right quality, um, the, the dietary needs, uh, maybe there's, you know, there's some other preferences out there that we, we weren't clued in on initially. Um, we had to adjust how we did our meal service. We had to pivot our, our business um, model totally. Um, we noticed, and we keep a very detailed log uh, each shift on, and, it, and it's really, it's, it's not complicated stuff. It's stuff we would do if we were, if this was a, a fully functioning hotel, which by the way it is. Um, if someone wanted an extra meal or the time that they ordered uh, a delivery, uh, we started to dig a little deeper with that and ask the questions we would um, any other time. It's like, you know, especially as it relates to food, and what we discovered was that in the, in the cases where people were doing a lot of ordering out, we just hadn't given them enough to eat. So we adjusted our delivery process and um, certainly the uh, um, quantity of food so that we would, we would be meeting their needs. And then what we discovered by doing that was the amount of deliveries decreased exponentially because we were finally, we finally hit, we met people where they needed to be met at least on, on the food side. Anecdotally, and, and, and Elise knows this story, we, um, we, we had trouble too. We were trying to get used to how to get the hot food upstairs and keep it hot uh, until the time it was delivered to our guests. It's actually a science for those of you who are um, wanna be uh, culinarians and, and food, you know, food people. I'm one of those people that wants to, strive to, but I'm not. Um, but trying to find a way to get the hot food hot and presentable when they when they opened up their uh, their meal. 
so we had we had a lot of a um, lot of science happening in the in the kitchen. We found vessels that were appropriate and attractive. By the time the meals got to the to our guests, when they opened it, it, it was exactly or close to exactly what they were hoping for. Um, we also found out that French fries are hard to travel. I should have known that because they never made it past, you know, I never got past the drive through McDonald's ever with my French fries. Um, but we, we do have a solution. I'm happy to report out we have a solution for that. Um, and finally, I, I guess what I, I really want want you to know is that our role is to support the clinicians and the staff to ensure they have everything they need to be successful upstairs in supporting the residents of our city. And to remember always that we're a hotel, although with a different mission, we're working every day to ensure our residents are getting the very best service from us. And we are leaning in with our partners of the city so that we can continue to support that mission. You know, these hotels, and I know that there's uh, a lot of hotels uh, throughout the city, the state and beyond that have a lot of extra rooms right now. Hotels are the best place if you're to, to, to look at a, an environment which can pivot and take care of the needs of the residents here in the city. Hotels are the right, are the right spot because you have private rooms, they have their baths, um, the food service component, it's safe and secure, and it, it provides for some other opportunities as well. We're doing, um, we have allocated space for learning centers uh, for the few families that we do have in the hotel with school aged children. We have a donation center. We're working for job placement, with job placement with uh, some of our partners beyond the hotel. And the hotels itself are great learning centers for people who are looking for jobs and to enhance their skills. Elise. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elise Gillespie. I work in the mayor's office in Baltimore City. Um, plainly put, my role early on as we responded to the pandemic was to cold call hotels and motels. Um, we knew from the early CDC guidance that securing places for people who are unstably housed or experiencing homelessness, you know, should they need to isolate due to exposure or having COVID was, you know, something that just had to be done. Um, so we, as a city, are engaged with five hotels, but obviously for reasons you'll hear, the Lord Baltimore is sort of the most unique um, partnership that we have. It is our isolation site. Um, it is a resource that's open to everyone, but we you know, inevitably end up serving largely folks who are either experiencing homelessness or um, live in congregate living settings or unstably housed. Um, so it is a place where you can come while you are awaiting your test results. Um, it's a place where you can remain while you are recovering from COVID-19 and don't need hospitalization. And we are there in partnership with the mayor's office the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services, the Baltimore City Health Department, and University of Maryland Medical System, who provides care support to our residents who are there. Um, since we have begun op operating our isolation site at the Lord Baltimore, I think at this point we've served about 600 people um, have come through um, this resource. As Analia mentioned, we are planning to um, open up additional floors to serve as shelter beds to um, alleviate some of the burden we have at our other shelters that are currently housed in hotels. Um, you know, we as a city are working on our strategy about when we think it will be safe for people to, if, you know, at all, to return to congregate living settings. Um, and we've just, you know, the, the partnership with the Lord Baltimore has afforded us great flexibility and um, they are willing to do just about anything we ask. When I said, you know what, I think we need more washer and dryers on the fifth, sixth and seventh floor. It's just a go. And so it's been a really wonderful experience to work with Analia and her team. Um, we have an incredible partnership with the University of Maryland Medical System too, um, as well as the two clinical leads from the health department who have served as our medical directors. Um, and again, while this resource is open to anyone who needs a place to safely isolate, um, we, we do have, you know, obviously largely serve those who are experiencing homelessness. That's the cliff notes. Happy to answer any questions if there's time. So it looks like we do have a little bit of time. If you want to use the raise your hand in the Zoom uh, before Senator Washington and I start, do any of the committee members have any questions? Or you can wave at us on screen if we see you. Okay, I don't see anybody's hand. Am I missing? Um, Senator Benson. You have to unmute, Senator. 
Senator, hit the space bar. Nope, try again, Senator. Senator Benson, you have to unmute. Can you? Okay. Uh, the, I want to ask one quick question here. How do we deal with the homeless uh, when it comes with the testing for pandemic uh, for the uh, for this pandemic? So early on, the city did universal testing at all of our shelters um, and a couple other of the privately run shelters as well. As well, um, at that point, after some of the universal testing was completed, we relocated the shelters in their entirety with staff to hotels um, testing. One of our um, strongest testing partners is Healthcare for the Homeless. They have the ability to test on site. So they accept referrals from anybody um, from our, any of our city funded shelters, as well as any of the other shelters that are in Baltimore City. So they are, I would say Healthcare for the Homeless is our strongest testing partner. And then we also have a referral process with the hospital systems. Um, so they know that if somebody comes in into their ER and has been tested, that they can discharge um, to the Lord Baltimore if the person is stable and does not need hospitalization. Uh, is, that the, is that the policy for Lord Baltimore? The Lord Baltimore is, mo most people who come through our doors are people who are awaiting test results or have already, are already confirmed positive. So we have the hotel separated um, by floor. So um, there are what we would call hot and cold zones. So spaces and floors that are specifically set up for residents who are COVID positive. Um, then there's a floor for residents who are awaiting test results. And then we have floors where it's just for those who are, um, who are negative and are there and are sheltering. Oh, okay. okay. All right, Senator. Um, we have a minute or two more. I don't see any other. Senator Washington, I have a couple questions. Do you mind? So I guess for Ms. Galepsi, what we're trying to understand too then is, is this a complete donation by Lord Baltimore or is there some assistance with the Lord Baltimore in terms of who they're taking from a financial perspective and the other five hotels that you are- um, all, of, all of our um, costs associated with sheltering people in hotels will be things that we submit to FEMA for reimbursement. So we are under contract um, with all of these hotels which are, and our costs associated with um, leasing out the hotels and there entirely is part of a submission we will make to FEMA for reimbursement. So if you could send back to the committee then what you think the estimated costs are gonna be for either it's a per diem rate or a case rate or so that we have a sense. Sure, yeah. I mean, I can, yeah, are. yep. I can absolutely get you that information. And um, did you have hotels that um, you asked that made decisions not to participate or for the most part were the hotels all willing to participate that you contacted? So it was a bit of a, a, a mixed bag. You know, we knew we would need hotels in their entirety. So hotels that had a, a significant number of guests to relocate were sort of discounted off the bat. We wanted the hotels to sort of be one-stop shopping, so to speak. So we wanted them to be able to, to uh, manage meals and cleaning. So we didn't have separate contracts for that. So there were hotels that said, you know, we could only provide you the rooms, you would have to handle food and cleaning. Um, so that sort of crossed a few folks off the list. There were definitely hotels um, that were not interested in um, housing people who are experiencing homelessness. That absolutely was, you know, a thing we came across. Um, we did a survey, I think, in early April, I think it was basically like a Google survey that we sent out to as many hotels as we could, um, you know, in this Baltimore metropolitan area. Um, at that point, you know, the Lord Baltimore came into play um, because the state was planning to use it as an alternative care site, um, but it became clear that they were not going to be able to, um, I don't know the terminology exactly, but they were not going to be able to be approved to become an alternative care site. And we at that time were seeking an isolation site in Baltimore City. We'd been operating one at a motel in Baltimore County and had, it was a very challenging site to manage. Um, so the state came to the city and offered to sign the a lease um, over to us for the Lord Baltimore. And that sort of is where the partnership with the University of Maryland Medical System was born. So that's, that's the, how we ended up um, you know, at the Lord Baltimore. And the good delegate Krim um, is unable to, she's listening, but her question is, 
is there an opportunity for you to send to the committee the demographics of the population that you're serving? So either what information you have um, so that we can best understand, are they women, children, men, um, any data that you have, ethnic? Yes, I can send the demographic data of um, everyone that we've served, men, women, age, um, were they a shelter referral, hospital referral, um, you know, where were they, you know where were they discharged to? We we have all of that information. Okay, and if you're able to, as a final question for me, to um, let us know the extent to the hotels that did not want to accept homelessness um, and were only willing to accept um, emergency or first responders and had maybe a, I guess a discriminatory perception of the business that they wanted to do with the city or not, it would be helpful. So I think I can go back to the survey and I should be able to extract um, some of that information from there. Be interesting to see if they're getting any state subsidies in any way. <laughs> Washington. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you, Delegate. Uh, my question is a broad one, but it can be answered and, and it's to just a reaction first to, um, to, to Ms. Shimmick, uh, uh, Analia, just uh, when you said your owner wanted to lean in and reach out and take care of the employees. I mean, I saw that you, we're just emotionally felt that I felt that as well. Um, and so while this is a Baltimore story, um, you know, do you think there's anything you just unique about this being Baltimore or, or our, our thought of course, is that this is something that can be replicated or expanded across the state. What are your thoughts in terms of, is this just a Baltimore thing or is this something you could see your partners in other parts of the state doing if we get it right? If we get it right, uh, Senator, I think we could do it in all parts of the state. You know, you have to have the right partnerships with uh, local and state. And in our case, we also had the uh, University of Maryland uh, component. So we had the clinical component. So um, it is definitely something that can be replicated throughout the state. Great, thank you. All righty. Um, and again, it, it, there'll be questions that we're following up. Uh, we, again, we have a tight agenda here, but again, I, I just want, to just on the behalf of this committee and, and all the people that you serve, we understand that um, the costs of you all, of your staff doing your creativity, your innovation, your commitment to having this be the right thing at the right time um, doesn't go unnoticed. And we just thank you uh, for all this heart, this wonderful work that you're doing. So, um, so next, uh, our other partners who, who, who are, uh, have always uh, disproportionately bear the burden um, uh, in solving our challenges around homelessness. We're going to hear from Natasha Mayhu, Legislative Director at MAKO. Are you here, Natasha? Yes, you are. Hi there. Yes, I am here. Apologies. <laughs> Having a little bit of tech issues here. Thank you. Just <laughs> before. Big screen, I can see, uh, you know, you're a little farther back. <laughs> there you go. Before she starts, just to remind the committee members, um, we have the slides that she's showing, then staff sent a follow-up, very detailed um, response from MAKO county by county. Um, so in addition to the slides, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, we have a lot of specifics by each county. Okay. Thank you. Thank Delia. you. And I, I thank you, um, uh, for having us here to brief the joint committee. Um, you know, as uh, Delegate Valentino Smith just said, I, I will briefly go over um, the information that we were asked to present on, which was whether or not counties are using hotels or other commercial spaces, um, either as part of their standard homeless prevention programs or in response to COVID needs. But we did um, submit a, a way more detailed um, county by county response. Um, I, I cannot do justice to providing the details on how each of the counties um, has really been rising up to the needs here and providing um, some um, uh, truly detailed services, one during this time of um, uh, pressing, um, as the previous um, panel noted, people losing their jobs, threats to um, eviction and growing homeless needs. Um, so they've been working with what limited resources they have to, to expand their protections um, and um, anticipate what will be needed later on. So if we could go to the next slide. Okay, 
So this gives a snapshot of what counties are doing in terms of using these hotels or commercial spaces just in general as part of their um, uh, homelessness prevention programs. Um, and so more than half of the counties, um, 13 in, in total, um, are using hotels as part of their response program. Um, in many of these situations, the counties did note that these are, these, um, these are used in times of uh, pressing need. So, um, and for limited resources. So it, it really supplements their program as opposed to um, being a main part of their homelessness prevention work. Um, and some of these cases, the counties themselves do not provide direct services, uh, but rather they um, contract out with nonprofit providers or DSS takes a larger role in providing the services. So in some of these cases I've where the county has said no, um, they've also noted um, that they do have other partners, whether it be DSS or um, um, uh, or a nonprofit provider providing that assistance. Okay. Um, so in the more narrative responses, a number of them noted, again, that these are used for targeted populations. So in general, I apologize, my, uh, in general, um, it is being used for families where they can't place them in congregate um, um, shelters or you know, victims of domestic violence or when there's a health situation. And so it's typically temporary um, extreme circumstances. Now, when we turn over to the next slide, which presents what the counties are using in terms of COVID-19 related um, housing assistance, um, nearly all of them are providing, um, are using hotels or other commercial spaces as part of that um, response program. Um, and I, I will note um, that in both of these situations, I did receive responses from Baltimore County after I've submitted this. And so while Baltimore County does not provide um, or use hotels during um, their standless, standard homeless prevention, they do fall in line with the counties listed here that do are using hotel space um, in uh, part of their COVID-19 related response. Um, and so here, uh, a lot of the counties are using CARES funding and additional CD CDBG funding um, to provide these services. Um, and primarily they're noting the need um, to avoid some of the risks that come with COVID-19, whether you need to um, provide more social distance. So the shelters, um, you know, where they had X amount of beds, now when you need to um, keep people separated and not have any, as many people together, you need those additional spaces to house these people. Um, and uh, was as was stated before, in a number of these cases, um, the jurisdictions are anticipating greater need for people that have lost their jobs, that are at risk of homelessness, at risk of eviction, um, even though there are still some protections in place now um, that are, um, the protections uh, um, certainly will not last indefinitely. And so using these hotels and commercial spaces um, is part of their broader COVID-19 um, related response plan. So in many of these cases, they also have eviction prevention programs. They have um, you know, rental and mortgage assistance programs they're running and using that all together to really try to um, um, prevent more people from um, becoming homeless. Um, and so if I could spend some time talking about these challenges there that they're seeing. Um, so in at least one county, you'll see here that Dorchester um, did approach their local hotels to see if they were interested in partnering, um, but they were not. Some counties are really small. They don't have very many hotels in the first place. So Caroline County only has one hotel. So while um, they, they do as part of their plan, they're willing to, to provide these services, they they don't necessarily have the space at those hotels to do so significantly. Um, I'll note that um, you know the funding and partnerships have been so important for the counties that you know 
Frederick County provided um, some additional information noting that they, between um, now or um, the past few months and up to December 30th, they anticipate spending between 1.5 and $2 million on um, um, homeless prevention and um, other housing related services. And um, it's important to note that this, these care funding, the money that came down um, from the federal government must be used by December 30th. So one of the biggest issues that are facing the counties right now is that um, you know, they're able to use these funds right now to supplement and provide hotel space and other needs. Um, but come September 30, December 30th, they will no longer have that funding. And um, again, they're anticipating additional people needing homeless prevention services, needing help, should the protections um, related to um, the eviction mor moratoriums or other assistance run out, then they're already um, anticipating a greater need for um, homeless prevention services, um, but also facing less funding to do so. Um, so I'll, I'll, I will end it there with that. This was a very brief snapshot, but as I noted in the more detailed response we sent over, it does go a, a lot more in depth into how each of the counties is using their funding, leveraging various sorts of resources to provide homeless assistance. And should you have any questions that I can't answer specifically, I'd be more than happy to relay this back to the jurisdictions or their specific jurisdictions and um, provide that information for you. Thank you. Do any of the members have any questions? Looking at the, okay. I don't see any. Um, just as a follow-up then, um, Ms. May, one, thank you. I think the um, counties did an excellent job giving us the detail um, in the detailed report. If, and we'll get back to you before you send back out to the counties, but I think the follow-up we would need then is with the CARES money running out in December, what each of the jurisdictions think their trending amount is or will be to maintain um, their use of the hotels and fiscally um, what they each put into it from the CARES money so far and what they think their future need um, would be to maintain that without the federal money. Obviously, the state has a lot of decisions to make, not only with the rainy day fund and the reserve account, but certainly going forward, um, the application of money in all different areas. So if we can help leadership understand um, what the geographic implications are, um, that would be helpful. All right, thank you, we'll do. Absolutely. And I think I just, uh, uh, Delegate, I just, I have just a question. Uh, in addition, that as a follow up, um, I know we asked you to focus on hotels, but we're also interested in other private businesses or commercial spaces or vacant schools or just any, any sort of larger structures that are being underutilized and that we anticipate will continue to be underutilized. Are, are, is anyone using other types of of, of, of commercial spaces. And we're, we're focused mostly on commercial privately owned spaces. So if you could get that, that back to us, that would be great. Sure. I think what we'll, what we'll ask you to do too then, just so the rest of the committee members know is we'll formulate a couple more questions because each of the counties did such a good job. So no good deed goes unpunished. A lot of <laughs> questions, but um, in, is understanding too what their recommendations are to us specifically so that they can do adaptive reuse of existing infrastructure. Okay, we're doing well with the agenda then. We'll move on to um, the Maryland Department of Human Services, DHR, and I think Lauren Graziano will start that. Yes, I will if I can ever figure out how to turn my, there we go, video on, there I am. Um, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Just quickly, I um, was going to introduce our panel that we have for you here today. Um, with us, we have Michelle Elfar. She's our Executive Director for the Social Services Administration. She's going to talk you through our presentation, talk about what the current status of the moratorium is in the state of Maryland regarding youth who are getting ready to age out of foster care, and some of the initiatives and efforts we've made in order transition smoother for our youth. With 
her. She has Serena Richard. She's our program manager for older youth and permanency. And we're also very lucky to have with us today um, two representatives from our local department of social services as well. They'll be here to help answer any questions you may have um, to what these operations look like on the ground at the local level. So with that, I, um, I will turn it over to my colleague, Michelle, whenever you're ready. This far. Okay, I just unmuted myself. Thank you so much. <laughs> the technology nowadays. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to share what uh, DHS FSA is doing now as it relates to serving and supporting our older youth. The information we will be imparting today, it's important to know that these efforts and initiatives have actually been developed prior to COVID-19. So yet we do agree with the national child welfare experts and the advocates recommending that state child welfare systems allow youth to remain in care rather than aging out at age 21 in Maryland in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you are aware, the justification for the extension of foster care uh, for our youth is very important because of the unpredictability of COVID-19, coupled by the potential influenza and what that impact may have on our youth. And so as we continue to look at the impact of housing and community uh, placement instability, as well as social isolation that's associated with what the CDC is requiring our youth to do and adhere to, we want to make sure that we try to stay on top of uh, how we serve our older youth. I want to also say, as Lauren has shared, that we have Serena Richard, who is the program manager of our Older Youth and Permanency Program, as well as Brandy Stocksdale, who is the Deputy Director of Child and Family Services for Baltimore City. And we have Renee Pope, Assistant Director of Community Services from Prince George's County. So I'm so glad to have them uh, join me today. We can turn to the next slide, please. So as I shared, the it state just... of Maryland recognizes the hardship of our older youth transitioning out of foster care during the pandemic. And it amplifies the impact of the financial and food securities, housing stability, and of course, mental health care. So these are some of the things that we have put in place moving forward. Uh, and again, some of this actually was occurring prior to the COVID, but focusing more on it now. So our youth aging out of care extension through December 31st, 2020, we recognize the importance of continuing to serve them and giving them an opportunity to plan for their transition. Uh, the Department of Social Services in conjunction with our local Department of Social Services have relaxed the requirements for our non-minor youth, minor youth. So what does that mean? That means that the monitoring compliance related to education, training, and treatment services for our youth, whether in semi-independent living arrangement programs or in enhanced aftercare programs, is secondary priority at this time. So although we have not placed a waiver uh, for these requirements, the inability for the youth to be able to uh, adhere to those requirements will not have a negative impact on our youth eligibility, or participation in the program. The other thing that we are doing is our efforts to encourage youth to stay in foster care. We understand that they are adults and sometimes they choose to make decisions, but our goal is to discourage them from leaving care. And likewise, the local Department of Social Services is also encouraging the youth to stay in care. And one example of that is Baltimore City DSS collaborated with their youth advisory board to create a video on social media to encourage the youth to adhere to the CDC requirements, which of course coupled with staying in care because that it, it's all about well-being for our youth. And you'll get an opportunity to see some of our other outreach efforts uh, in a moment. So leaving care during the pandemic can create many challenges for our youth. And so we really want to encourage them to not get into a posture 
of re-entering care. And so beyond our efforts to keep children in care, we continue to examine efforts that can be taken to address how to reach eligible youth to ensure that they're safe and they have access to re-entry processes while maintaining compliance and program integrity. So again, our goal is to try and keep our youth within our care for as long as we can, particularly with regards to the, the pandemic. The last thing I want to share is the utilization of safety funds. So as we know, the safety funds requires a state funding match. And given our current state economic challenges, there may be some obstacles to securing those federal funds. However, DHS is committed to working with our federal partners to explore all available sources to ensure the safety and well-being of our older youth in foster care, as well as our recent alum, alumni. Next slide, please. So here you see a couple of links. One is Stay at Home Campaign. That's the one I referenced uh, that the Baltimore City Department of Social Services partnered uh, to um, uh, encourage our youth to, one, stay safe during the pandemic, but also to be mindful of their overall well-being, which, of course, is uh, coincides with staying in care. The second link, which, again, you should have access to through the PowerPoint, is our Opportunity Passport video. And that video actually was in partnership with our Jim Casey Youth Opportunities in Baltimore City, and it provides them with other resources and, again, encourages our youth to stay in care. The virtual town hall meeting. So from the onset of the pandemic, DHS, SSA, held weekly virtual town halls for our youth to provide Q&A opportunities and peer solution-focused support. So the town halls were developed to allow the youth to, to find out opportunities and resources, whether they are in care or whether they are thinking about leaving care. And it was an opportunity for them to also connect with their peers and to really understand what others were going on, which was a part of encouraging them to actually stay in care. So we are very, very pleased about that. The, the town halls were occurring on a weekly basis, and then we moved them to biweekly, and partly because we saw that the youth were not as engaged or participating as frequently. And so now we've encouraged our local uh, independent living coordinators from each of the jurisdictions to continue that. Uh, but we're also very amenable to reintroducing or reestablishing that as we need to. But that's another vehicle by which to stay engaged with our youth. Next slide, please. My Life website. So this is a very, will be once we launch it during this fiscal year, a very interactive opportunity for our youth to be able to find out what are the resources that they can garner through this website. So it's not just for our youth in care or transitioning from care, but it really speaks to what do our youth need. And this website was designed for youth with the youth voice at the table. And so when we are able to launch this, we will be excited to share this information with you in more detail. Just another mechanism by which to stay in touch with our youth and to also garner what their needs are and to ensure that we are addressing what those resources are available to them within the community. Okay, next slide. Ms. Ms. Farr, the information um, on the slides is helpful. And I think because of time, um, two things. What we're going to do is ask you to pivot the comments more to your understanding of the youth and their housing status, um, both youth pre-pandemic and or post-pandemic, um, and the efforts that are directed to at their housing status. And then we do want to leave a little bit of time so that we can hear from Ms. Dale and Ms. Pope. Um, so if you could move, um, it would be helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. And so part of the transition planning services, as you see in this slide, really correlates to what their decisions are if they are choosing to exit the, the foster care. What we are doing is collecting data. And as of now, we know that we have um, 
we have approximately 943 youth between the ages of 18 and 21 that are in our out of home uh, population. And from that, we understand that those that are turning 21 is 335. And that's turning 21 between the, the time frame of April 20 to June 2021. And the reason why I'm sharing that data with you is because thus far, and again, we are extending through October now, we have only seen 39 that we are able to track youth that have opted to not stay in care. So what are we doing in terms of trying to reach out to them? We have the independent living coordinators that, of course, help to develop these transitional plans with our youth, which speaks to what their plans are in terms of their housing moving forward once they're exiting. As well, we will also ask them if there's any reason for them to reach back out to us that we would be available to assist them as necessary. Some of the youth we believe are moving back with their families. Some of the youth are moving in through other programs such as DDA. And so as we are beginning to really hone in on tracking what that looks like, we'll be able to provide more information uh, pertaining to that. I'm going to turn to Serena Richard just to make sure that I have not missed anything or, or um, something else she might want to share with relation to that. And again, and again, for the three that are left from DHR, if you can help give us the specific understanding um, of what's being done. I know we're hearing a lot of broad things about reaching eligible youth or tracking eligible youth, but what we're looking for is some of the specifics here on what you know about their housing status. Thank right. you. And Serena? Yes, thank you. Um, I was just gonna say um, that what Michelle shared is um, right on target. Um, we are um, definitely reaching out to our youth and trying to ensure that we are reevaluating the readiness of our youth. And what that means for our youth and what that means for us is making sure that they do have safe and stable housing when they exit care and that they also have secured financial support and income, um, as well as making sure that they have identified and we have provided additional resources for them to have the opportunity to connect to social and emotional support that we know is going to be helpful and to um, provide better outcomes for our youth. And I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Michelle. Thank you. And so some of the things that we are doing as well is partnering with our Family Investment Administration for those teens that are parenting and have minor children that are not committed to the agency. Of course, they're eligible for SNAP and for TCA benefits. So it's incumbent upon us to help them in navigating and getting through that system. We're also, providing them with educational and training vouchers. And those vouchers can, can be up to $5,000 annually to cover the cost of attendance in an institution of higher education. We are also providing them with uh, family unification program vouchers to assist them with housing. Um, we're also providing them with information on budgeting and financial workshops, career development and employment apprenticeships, as well as what is also so extremely important is linking them to mental health, dental, and medical services. And so this is a comprehensive approach in how we are looking to assist our youth and transitioning during this time. And again, I want to reiterate that this, what we we're doing isn't because of COVID-19, but this is something that we've been doing as a part of our transition plan in serving our youth. COVID-19 just seems to impact, if you will, the population and the decisions that they're making. It yes, it certainly has exacerbated existing conditions. I think I have a question and maybe maybe the maybe Ms. Pope would answer it because I, I'm very curious as to what type of support D, DHS is providing to, to the local departments of social services to, to support the youth over 21. Uh, in addition to your regular caseload, right? So we all know everything exacerbated. So this is about addition, specifically maybe how are Family First Prevention Services Act transition funds being used? And are they being used in conjunction with the CARES money and Chafee funds? But, you know, what kind of support are our local departments of social services getting from DHS? 
So we were fortunate enough to, of course, get the CARES fund, uh, and we have distributed those funds to the local departments for their uh, distribution as they see appropriate within their jurisdiction. And some of them have been using them to support older youth. Some of them have been using them to uh, support uh, uh, other kinds of tangible needs that uh, families and children may have. Um, we have also recently um, worked with our federal government and was able to get some funding there as well that is allowing us to provide assistance to uh, those that are providing care to our children. And so we continue to, to research and try to secure funding as best as we can in considering the, the financial climate that we're in to be able to support our families, our youth, as well as our children. As a follow-up um, to Senator Washington, very specifically, I think what we would both be asking Ms. Stocksdale and Ms. Pope are, did your case managers receive the equipment and technology that they needed to be able to work from home? And what is the ability, if you understand it, of the locals to be able to be managing their caseloads from home, um, given the need for the technology and the computers and assistance? So I will turn it over to both Ms. Pope and to Ms. Stockdale, and then I will follow up. Good afternoon. This is Brandy Stockdale. Um, I am the Deputy Director for Child Welfare in Baltimore City. And so um, to your question, Delegate, yes, um, we were all thrown into this on, was it March? 18th, I believe, and we were able to quickly mobilize our workforce um, and get all of the equipment, not just um, laptops, but um, iPads and anything that our workers needed to be in the field. Um, I think the good thing about child welfare is that our work has always been in the field. And so I, I do think it was a, a little easier transition for us um, but we are, we are mobile, we are in the field, we are seeing our youth and children and families. And so, yes, to your question, we did get the support that we needed, absolutely. Hmm. Ms. Poe? Was she there? Yes, yeah, she was. Uh, Renee? Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm here. Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, so to the, with respect to the issue of equipment, um, most uh, Prince George's transitioned actually during the point of the pandemic to sea jams. And so new equipment uh, was already uh, in play for our child welfare staff. Um, and so while that was an interesting transition on top of the pandemic, um, our staff um, received new equipment, both phones and um automated uh, laptops and uh, computers that were necessary to do their work. Uh, and that was deployed to the team. Um, so from a technology perspective, we are actually um, in a fairly strong position with respect to that. I think that there's always the challenge around um, deploying personally in the field and making sure that our teams are protected while we're ensuring the protection of children and addressing the issues of ongoing investigation. I think it would be, um, I think it would be short-sighted not to mention that the pandemic has certainly had an implication on um, local agencies' capability to have um, respite placements and foster care placements for young people. Um, there are a lot of families that are concerned about personal safety and well-being with COVID and protections and the idea of taking in a young person that's not necessarily um, an immediate biological member of the family has presented or exacerbated um, family identification and safe places for children. I don't think the issue is so much us being able to respond. We're used to that. Um, to the need for our children to be protected, but our ability to provide the appropriate and the strength-based support that we need to be able to support those young people is particularly challenged with COVID and, and personal fears related to that. 
Um, but from a technology perspective, uh, we were we did have the equipment from the state to deploy. Um, they're constantly reaching out to us uh, to determine and identify what supports, additional supports we need. Thank you, Ms. Pope, Pope for being, because, um, you know, we, we when we're asking these questions, we generally know that we already know that we don't provide as much support. We know there's already challenge that you have existing challenges and we want you to be very honest with us about where the gaps are. It is, this is not simply, this is not a time. I mean, we know you do hard work. We know you make do, but what we believe very strongly is that you deserve more. The children of our state deserve more. Um, and so, help the, the only way for us to really make productive use and to make good recommendations is for us to, um, you know, so this isn't a, 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 a hearing for you to simply demonstrate how good you're doing. It, it is an opportunity for you to tell us what are those gaps. So I appreciate that, that honesty. And then additionally, I think we're going to transition out of this, but it, it, I'm glad you raised it is that face to face. I, I applaud that you are set up a website. I applaud also the extension to the December 31st. I want to lift that up because our committee requested that there be an extension. Um, and so there is an extension, but we also would like to um, understand, you know, perhaps we should be looking at when the co when it's over. Um, month to month, what, this is an improvement over month to month, but there's still uh, housing insecurity uh, in an already uh, unstable population. So um, I guess that was more of a, isn't it so? Uh, we don't have time. Um, thank you though for the presentation. Thank you for the hard work that you're doing. Uh, but we're very, very, you know, we're, I, I've said it, we're, we're interested in where the gaps are uh, when it particularly comes to funding and being able to provide services in community uh, where, where it's needed most. And I see Senator um, Benson is, is, is nodding her head. Um, so um, thank you so much. So now we're going to hear uh, from um, Senator our Washington before yes, they completely transition off the pedestal. Can I just give them some quick to do's? Yes, please do. You're right. Thank you. So for the department, um, again, echoing what the Senator said, um, it's good for us to hear the job that you're trying to do. And we are not here to be critical as much to understand. So with that being said, can you please send us back the specific information with respect to December? when the moratorium ends, the number of children that you expect to age out, and what the cost would be for them to continue in care through June, or each month, what the cost would be for them to continue in care, okay? So the number, I know that you gave us some statistics that you expect that would be aging out in December when the moratorium ends, and what the cost to the state would be to maintain them in care. The other question that, um, one of the delegates asked is, can you please send back whether or not any of the CARES money or money was used for the um, in-home placements and for the foster parents that had additional costs related to PPE or any other additional pandemic costs? In other words, mm -hmm. were there any decisions or policies made to help supplement the uh, foster care parents in their reimbursement? And then please give us the demographics that you said that you have for the foster youth that are on temporary cash assistance, that are eligible for it, that are getting SNAP, that are getting housing vouchers and or using the educational vouchers. So you suggested to us that that's something that you offer. I think what we really need to see and I, you can appreciate is very specific. The number that were discharged last year that used and, dis and were discharged with SNAP, temporary cash assistance, housing vouchers, educational assistance, and the number that were not and the demographics would be helpful and the same for those that you anticipate in the release in the fall. Thank you, Senator. Certainly happy to pro provide that as a follow up delegate. And then the last the last follow up, I, I actually I forgot myself, but the, when you, the, the cameras that you the laptops that you issued, uh, I just want to know uh, how many had cameras and to make sure that they had the, the cameras. Um, so now we're transitioning to hear from um, uh, our other partners, our advocacy um, service providers, a range of, of, of people uh, in this field. Uh, I know that the official end time of this hearing, uh, this briefing is three o'clock. So there are some members that need to, need to go, uh, but uh, the, uh, Delegate Valentino Smith and I will, I uh, believe we are able to continue. I guess I should ask staff, they'll let me know, um, but I think we'll be able to at least provide uh, an additional 10 minutes. Um, so with that in mind, 
Uh, we're going to hear from uh, United Way uh, and um, I guess get, well, where is Getco in it? Uh -oh. Are we holding them each now to seven minutes, Senator? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Okay. Oh. Are we starting with Getco and then Women's Housing Coalition? Is that the order? Because I have two different. <laughs> I think we have United Way with Scott. Yep. There okay. we go. Okay, United Way of Central Maryland. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you to the committee chairs and to the committee for having us here today and for your attention to the issue of housing during this time of unprecedented crisis. If you could go to the next slide. Many people know United Way as a fundraiser and systems coordinator, but fewer know that we have increasingly taken on the role of direct service provider over the past decade. Since COVID began, we have stepped up to address the crisis in several ways, and I'd like to talk about two of those related to housing today. Next slide, please. Our 211 Maryland helpline has been at the front line of the COVID emergency response system. 211, for those of you who don't know, is an information and referral service. I like to think of it as 911 for social services. Callers get referred to access for food, energy assistance, housing services, medical needs, and much more. Governor Hogan has been advising Marylanders to call 211 for information and assistance during many of his press conferences. 211 typically answers more than 100,000 calls per year, but demand for 211 has more than tripled since the crisis began. Now, for the first time since the Great Recession, housing has become the number one need people are calling about as past due rents have piled up and landlords are pursuing legal remedies. We're also seeing a huge uptick in the past week of utility assistance calls as moratoriums on utility shutoffs come to an end. In addition to 211, and you can go to the next slide, United Way of Central Maryland also operates our Family Stability Program, which is a $1.6 million annual investment and one of the largest nonprofit eviction prevention programs in the state. The program consists of 16 sites throughout Central Maryland. Two of the sites are operated by United Way and the other 14 sites are operated by local partners who we fund to implement the model. Each site serves up to 30 families per year and as a whole, the program prevents 500 families from becoming homeless each year. The next slide, please. To be eligible, families must have school-aged children and must live in one of the footprint areas, which we've selected based on data about needs and gaps in the region. The program has a 98% success rate at keeping families housed. We also just completed a study that found that our program has a four to one return on investment, meaning that every $1 that is invested into our program prevents $4 from having to be spent elsewhere in the system on addressing needs such as shelter beds, crisis response, relocation services, and so on. You can go to the next slide. Our program model is so successful because it pairs eviction prevention, which is especially urgent right now, with intensive case management and flexible financial assistance. Our decade of experience with this model has shown that the case management piece is the secret ingredient. The case managers help families access workforce opportunities and apply for benefits like food stamps or unemployment. They do financial counseling and budgeting. They help clients navigate the confusing world of program eligibility requirements and application windows or deadlines and wait lists. Just like you wouldn't want to go into a courtroom without an attorney, so too do you not want to approach the world of social services without a case manager. And that's exactly what our program offers. If funding were available, we would love to expand this program to serve more families. If we could advocate for anything in front of this committee today, it would be to allow staffing costs to be a part of the funding strategies that are being considered across the state. There are a lot of new client assistance funds that are coming online, but most do not allow for case management costs or even indirect costs or admin. This is making a lot of partners hesitant to take part in helping to move these funds along because there's no way to cover the expense of hundreds of hours required to process applications or interface with clients and landlords. The bottom line is that some families will require some handholding to address the self-sufficiency piece. Otherwise, they'll have to keep coming back for rental assistance again and again. Addressing self-sufficiency requires staff time and staff time requires funding. Another blind spot that we are seeing coming up on the horizon is large back rents. We have seen several jurisdictions in the planning phases of eviction prevention um, that are proposing that clients who are past due, for example, by six months will be offered relocation assistance like moving costs and first month's rent instead of eviction prevention, since relocation is cheaper. We at United Way want to insist that this is a bad idea. Our extensive experience from eight years of serving more than 2,000 families facing housing instability suggests that dislocating fa families tends to send them tumbling into a cascade of instability in all other areas of their lives. 
For children of these families, each move puts them an average of three months behind in school, and this is a big driver of kids being held back or dropping out. The relocation approach to large back rents also leaves the tenants with big back rents that are basically insurmountable debt, several thousands of dollars. This debt will follow them for years to come and make it nearly impossible for them to find stable housing going forward. I'd also like to bring to your attention the fact that United Ways in other states have been tapped to play a larger role in responding to the housing crisis. In North Carolina and Dallas, for example, governments have made two-on-one into the front door for assistance for households facing eviction. And those United Ways have played central roles in coordinating partners and divvying up caseloads. United Ways are great for this because we are nimble and flexible and can quickly adapt to changing circumstances. We also have a great deal of data at our fingertips and we can see where blind spots are emerging. Like for example, the fact that many households cannot document loss of income due to COVID because they were between jobs when the crisis erupted or they've been working in the informal economy. This is a huge blind spot that we haven't really seen any uh, legislation recently addressing. We're happy to lend our expertise if any of you have any information needs concerning the landscape of social services uh, and service providers in the region. And in the interest of time, I'll stop there and we'll be happy to answer any questions. That's exactly what we needed. Thank you. Um, we're not going to ask you questions now. We're going to get through the, the whole the whole uh, panel. Um, but thank you for those very specific uh, gaps and blind spots. Thank you. Uh, so next, we're here from the Fair Housing Action Center of Maryland. I believe that's next on, on our list. That's Carol Ott, Tenant Advocacy Director. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. Um, so generally when I create these PowerPoints, they're more for me so that I stay on track and don't go completely off the rails on some random topic. So just very briefly, what we do is we assist tenants with tenant landlord questions. We also assist landlords with tenant landlord questions. Um, and eviction prevention is one of those things that's in our mission and goals and kind of, you know, it's sort of an all encompassing um, issue. And so one of the things that I wanted to provide was a really brief data snapshot just to show what we're seeing on the ground and just to give you a really good example, for 2019, I had a caseload of 239 inquiries, clients, um, people that I had to assist with various issues. And that was for the whole year from January to December. By the end of August of this year, that had doubled. And our requests for assistance with eviction prevention has gone up 1,667%, um, and that is not a typo. I wish it was. A lot of the families and households who come to us, um, they, there's a child in the home. Most times it's more than one child. They're school-aged children. And I think it's really important to note that of all the people who have come to us for help this year, 69% of them are women. Most of those women are single moms and 57% of them are black. And it's also interesting to note that of that 57% who are black women, that statistic has not really changed year over year. So, you know, people have said a few different, at a few different stages during this meeting um, that COVID did not cause a lot of these issues. It merely exacerbated existing issues and it very publicly showed us where the cracks are, particularly in my mind from what I'm seeing from our clients is the lack of equity and equality in housing and that goes statewide. So our top issue area this year has been eviction. Um, the second largest has been financial assistance of some general kind, not necessarily relating 
to eviction. But typically when you're at the point where you can't pay your rent, that also means that the BGE and the PEPCO and the food and everything else is starting to tumble off the financial cliff as well. So, you know, I'm a big believer in housing being the main core, you know, sort of touchstone of our lives. And, you know, when your housing is unstable, everything else is like dominoes. They just, you know, everything else just starts to fall off too. And so this is also the first year where county inquiries, particularly Baltimore County, has overtaken Baltimore City in the number of people who need assistance from us. And I've been doing this work for close to 10 years, if not over 10 years. I've kind of lost track at this point. Um, and this is the first time I've ever had so many people from one county reaching out for financial assistance and eviction prevention. So <clears throat> this is all exacerbated by a few additional issues, tenant harassment, illegal evictions, um, management companies, some of them have figured out ways to get around the eviction moratoriums by simply not renewing leases and the tenants have a lot less protection in those cases and the evictions typically happen a lot faster than in failure to pay cases. So that's something that I would like people to be aware of and we are indeed tracking this. We gather a lot of data from the folks who come to us for help and we are perfectly happy to share any of that data um, except the person's contact information and address with people who, you know, if you want to see it, just send us an email and I'm more than happy to share whatever it is you're looking for. So there's a few solutions that I think could be implemented that would help. The first is always going to be direct financial assistance, whether it's to tenants or whether it's to landlords. You know, we have to get these people's rent paid. There's no excuse for this. There's no excuse to tell people that you have to wait until your unemployment kicks in when it takes six months for your unemployment to kick in. What happens during that six months? There's, there's no magic pot of money for these folks. And I think it's also important to note that a lot of these people did work before COVID and a lot of them had really good paying jobs. So, you know, we're not just talking about very poor people. We're also talking about people who were, you know, kind of reaching, getting closer to middle class, or they were solidly middle class and something happened and they got laid off due to COVID and now they can't pay for their lives. They can't, you know, they can't take care of their kids. They can't provide housing. They can't buy food. And for a lot of folks, this is the first time that they've ever experienced this level of financial insecurity. And so they're super confused as to what to do. So it takes a little longer to get some of these folks, you know, plugged into different resources, but we're doing it. Um, I would love for there to be increased state funding for eviction and homelessness prevention and legal services for tenants. We need to give tenants the right to counsel. Landlords show up with armies of lawyers sometimes to rent court. If you've ever sat in rent court, it, it's really something to watch. You have a large management company with, you know, at least one, if not two or three attorneys, and you have a tenant with who basically shows up with a Safeway bag full of receipts, and that's about it. And so these folks need legal counsel. They need to, to be aware of their rights and they need to exercise their rights. And we'd also ask that legislation be enacted that would remove eviction filings against tenants where no actual eviction took place. Large management companies will robofile evictions. And so even though the person pays their rent, they might have paid late, but they paid it, that eviction filing is still on their record and that can prevent tenants from obtaining safe housing in the future. And so, you know, we're not just concerned with people 
now during the pandemic, but we have to be forward thinking and think about all the things that we can do to not only prevent something like this, a housing crisis like this from ever happening again, because it absolutely, don't make any mistake, it is 1000% preventable. That this should never have happened in the first place, but here we are. And so we need to be forward thinking and talk about what we can do to make sure that this never happens again. And one way to do that is to ensure that the tenants who are experiencing eviction filings now will not be prevented from obtaining safe housing in the future. And so at the end of my lovely PowerPoint, which did, by the way, keep me on track, um, you can find our website and my email address. And I strongly urge anybody to make good use of my email address. I always respond. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, to find my button. Thank you very much for that and for the timeliness. And there's lots, I'm getting lots and lots of questions. Um, we will we'll make sure we will maybe say them at the end, but we'll get the answers later. Um, next, um, I have, I'm going to just change the order just a little bit. Um, is uh, Nicole Battle um, available uh, to talk with us now? I am. Then I'll do the consumer rights uh, MCRC. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm Nicole Battle. I'm the CEO of Govan Ecumenical Development Corporation, and in partnership with faith-based and community organizations, we provide housing and supportive services for older adults, people who are formerly homeless, as well as emergency assistance to residents in the community. Um, as it relates to homelessness, GetCo currently operates two Housing First programs in Baltimore, Micah House and Hartford House. Um, we've owned, operated, and provided services to these two communities for over 25 years. Um, they're currently single room occupancy buildings where we have advocacy and addictions counselors on staff. And through grant funding, we have secured a mental health specialist to address some of the challenges we're seeing with our applicants who are chronically homeless and or have multiple diagnoses. Um, we have now been a Housing First program for over three years, and we found it somewhat challenging from a staff perspective and an occupancy perspective. Um, though we've received subsidy to pay a majority of our staff, we have found that our residents are requiring a little bit more services to help them transition from homelessness to being housed. Um, Due to the Housing First program, they're not required to participate um, in services offered. So we're just trying to be really creative and really sharing with them the benefit of being a part of the services that we're offering on site. Um, in order to receive the subsidy from the state through Baltimore City, um, we have also received all applicants from the appropriated access system, if you're not aware. Um, we are lucky we may be able to get through the entire process and house a person, um, but in order to receive a housing voucher and to be housed, residents have to go through a process where we're gathering paperwork and they need it to accompany their applications for housing. Thankfully, during COVID, because of the reduced staff schedules of HABC, we were able to do a lot of our housing certifications at our sites as opposed to fully going through HABC. Um, in addition to that partnership and our Housing First programs, GetCo also provides funding to individuals to assist with eviction prevention. Um, there are people who may not live in the housing that um, qualifies for the assistance that some lords are receiving from the state. So we've used donations and have applied for grants specifically to address those types of residents. So we're averaging at this point five requests a week um, but recognize that this number will increase once the eviction moratorium is lifted. Um, as an organization, we're only able to afford to um, provide $200 um, per household twice a year. Um, as a result of COVID, we've increased it to 300 and hopefully um, we'll be able to increase it a little bit more. But by saying in 300, we're able to address the needs of more people than if we were, if we had to increase the premium. 
Um, some of the recommendations that we have is one, continue to allow owners and property managers to do the certifications on site. Um, there should be for consideration a temporary waiver of the strict definition of homelessness. Um, I think right now there's proof of three instances of documented homelessness. Um, people still need to require proof that they're homeless. Um, I don't know if this can be impacted by, by the state, but reducing the amount of paperwork, which kind of supports what I just said, um, from both Mayor's Office of Human Services, as Homeless Services, as well as HABC. Um, possibly a temporary lifting of the coordinated access process, um, allowing applicants to apply directly to programs as opposed to what's kind of like an additional step of bureaucracy for residents to actually get housed. Um, faster reinspection scheduling. Um, it usually takes a while to schedule inspections, and if there has to be a reinspection, it takes even longer. Um, maybe a waiver to allow people to move in and then inspections occur later. Um, currently, the whole building needs to be reinspected by different inspectors when a unit is being prepared for lease, so adding extra time and bureaucracy. Um, and another challenge, which um, is always at the forefront of our minds, is just even emergency housing for older adults who are homeless or facing homelessness. Um, just this week alone, or last weekend this week, we um, ran across a gentleman who was being evicted today. Um, he had not paid his rent, um, but we couldn't find really any emergency housing for him. And so um, I, I truly believe that that's a population that we need to pay attention to, older adults who are facing homelessness. And um, we should look at, I know that the DHCD is currently um, working on their housing survey about the need for affordable housing for older adults, but this is something we should consider. And as my last bullet point, you know, we have 24 residents at Micah House and 18 residents residing at Harford House. So that's a total of 42 residents out of 57 potential units um, that we have, that if we're able to really kind of implement some of those things we suggested, that'll allow us to quickly um, house people, we can, uh, we can take care of those big units we have. And that's all I have today. And thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, delegate, you want to take it? Yeah, I just, um, you know, we shouldn't have you sitting there with vacant units that could be yeah. right now yeah. as a state. So we're going to follow up on that uh, right away. So next, um, I think we're going to skip around a little bit in the order. So we're going to hear from Maryland Multi-Housing Association next. And that's Aaron Greenfield. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Thank Great. you. And, and Thank in the you, essence Madam of Chair. time, if you can try to hold to five minutes, that'd be helpful. Yeah, I will be extraordinarily brief. Um, thank you. But, but with recommendations. <laughs> Madam Chair Washington, Madam Chair Valentino Smith, and committee members, Aaron Greenfield on behalf of the Maryland Multi Housing Association. Thank you for the opportunity to come and present. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, we wanted to sort of give you a sense of what we're seeing as we've surveyed our members. Uh, which in this sampling is about 100,000 units. A comparison from uh, uh, mid-month to uh, month's end. And in each situation, you see uh, that the uh, rental uh, amount reduces um, at the end of the month. And what that's telling us is that, the de that delinquencies are clearly occurring at a high level. Uh, but that uh, residents are paying their rent throughout the month. Uh, now, that's going to um, cause some concern, I think, and we'll get to that in the next slide. But I think that's an important uh, slide to just see, and uh, that's the conclusion we've drawn. Next slide. And then this is a, a comparison of... Um, the uh, 2019 delinquency percentage and 2020 delinquency percentage. Uh, and you see that, um, uh, again, you know, pretty similar. June um, was, was high, um, higher than, than 2019, and July was 
higher as well as 2019. We are concerned and have been concerned about August and going forward because of um, uh, the, un the end of the unemployment insurance. And so that is a cause for concern going forward in terms of delinquencies. Next slide. So just, I'm gonna try and be very brief on this. This is just a breakdown. People, a lot of folks don't understand kind of the, the um, how far a dollar goes in, in this industry. Um, about 39 cents of every dollar pays for the mortgage on the property. Uh, 10 cents of every dollar is spent on capital expenditures. 14 cents of every dollar goes to property taxes, which you know supports community through you know teachers, emergency services, all the very important local needs. 27 cents of every dollar covers payroll expenses, employees, you know, vendors, insurance, and the like. Um, and then about nine cents to every dollar is returned to the owners, um, uh, some of whom are small businesses um, and others are larger investors. Next slide. Um, and again, I won't go through this, but uh, there's ongoing local rental assistance programs and um, local uh, rent uh, stabilization bills that have passed. Uh, the locals are doing a, a great job uh, to the degree they can on the rental assistance programs. We've been, as an association, cataloging them on this page and the next slide. Just by way of example. Uh, and it's hard to keep up with. Uh, and I know there was just around uh, an application end on CDBG dollars, the department. And then next slide. And so, so just from our perspective, um, uh, you know, things to consider, you know, just uh, blanket eviction moratoriums without sufficient rental assistance just kicks the can down the road for, for eviction. It just, it just does. Um, it would be impossible for residents to pay back potentially tens of thousands of dollars in back or rent when a moratorium ends. It's not fair for the resident and it's not fair for the landlord. Um, if housing providers can't afford to pay their bills, the result will be housing instability because they have, uh, as previously noted, um, you know, mortgages as well. And then the last slide, I believe, is um, just, we urge everyone just to communicate. Uh, both sides have to communicate candidly. And uh, it's really important that there's um, communication that, that tenants are letting their property management know what they're going through, what they're dealing with. If payment plans are an option, then let's discuss that. Thank you again for the time. Thank you. Um, I think given the, the lead that we've had now um, with respect to uh, landlords and mortgages, why don't we go ahead and hear from the Maryland Bankers Association, Mindy Lehman, and Bob Etten, if you can um, help us understand, but also at the same time be brief, both what's happening with respect to mortgages for residential homeowners and, um, for, and foreclosures, but also mortgages with respect to these landlords, because we've heard a lot about if you're getting mortgage assistance from the federal government, maybe you need to offer some rental assistance uh, downstream. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bob Enten, I'm an attorney. Uh, with a firm called Gordon Feinblatt, which is uh, headquartered in, in Baltimore City. Uh, I've been general counsel to the Maryland Bankers Association for over 30 years and appear in front of uh, many of you on a regular basis uh, for them when the legislature's in session. Uh, uh, Mindy, you, we have a slide uh, package, which Mindy Lehman, who is our senior vice president for government affairs will go over. I just want to make a couple brief comments. Um, First of all, in the state of Maryland, since April the 3rd, uh, we have had a, uh, a moratorium on any new foreclosure actions whatsoever. That's number one. So uh, any, uh, and under Maryland law, you can't foreclose on a residential mortgage unless you send a notice of intent to, a notice of intent to foreclose at least 45 days before the following. On April the 3rd, the governor issued an order and that order states that the um, Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation will no longer receive notices of intent to foreclose. The effect of that 
was to have a stay when all mortgage foreclosure filings were a notice of intent to foreclose and not previously been sent. Um, secondly, under the Federal CARES Act, uh, which is in effect and it, I might, uh, will remain in effect for some time, uh, a borrower, a, a mortgage borrower, uh, whose loan uh, is guaranteed through Fannie, through Freddie, through FHA, and generally speaking, all lenders follow these guidelines, uh, is entitled to two 180-day forbearances. And all they have to do is request it and sign, this, uh, and sign a certificate that says they can't pay their mortgage because of COVID, and they don't have to pay for 360 days. So I think uh, in, you know, one of the things that happens with Maryland Bankers Association, which has been in existence since 1896, is that when legislators have, or uh, government officials have uh, constituent problems, they reach out to the MBA to get help. We have not had a single legislator reach out to us since the whole COVID thing started to say they, could we assist one of their constituents with a forbearance issue. Uh, under current Maryland law, it takes about 545 days to go from default to ratification of the foreclosure sale. So even whenever this all gets lifted, um, you're still gonna have almost a year and a half before any foreclosure sale will be ratified. So I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, for, for us anyway, um, and Mindy will kind of walk through the slides and we're happy to answer any questions. I think what you're going to see is that between what's happening at the state level and what's happening at the federal level, uh, foreclosure has really not been an issue uh, as part of the COVID uh, at, this, at this time. Uh, the bottom line for us is that uh, uh, it makes the, the worst thing in the world for a lender is to have the property go to foreclosure. There are no surpluses when the properties get sold. It takes maybe on average two, a year and a half or two years to go through the foreclosure process. There the wouldn't be in the foreclosure process if the borrower was making any payments. They make no payments during that period. They stay in the house and they make no improvements to the house. So we don't want to foreclose. Just like you heard from Aaron Greenfield, our, our theme is please, if you have a foreclosure issue, if you can't pay your mortgage, please reach out to your lender and your lender will bend over backwards to work with you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mindy. Great, thank you, Bob. And then um, I'll tick through this PowerPoint in a quick pace and just fill in some additional detail. Um, Bob provided a really nice overview. So we'll just dig a little bit deeper in there and show you some resources. So if we could advance a slide. Um, so briefly, we're going to talk about the more, the, excuse me, the mortgage um, foreclosure moratoriums that are in place, as Bob said, at both the federal and the state level, as well as the uh, mortgage assistance that is in place. So if we could move forward. Another slide. So in terms of the MBA and the role of the industry, we very proactively went out with press releases and building on what Mr. Greenfield said, the key is really communication. If a borrower has any concern, whether they're a commercial borrower, a residential mortgage borrower, reach out to your banker. So let them know. If you just start to have concerns, you're worried you might get laid off, start that communication trail as quickly as possible. That will maximize the, op the options that you have and your lender can be a trusted resource in helping you navigate that. So if we could advance to another slide. And then on the MBA's website, we set up um, a link on our direct website. You can utilize that as a resource. It has some helpful um, links to various agencies that provide additional detail that are consumer facing information to help folks navigate what their different options are um, with the federal relief that's currently in place. If we could advance the slide. Thank you. So in terms of the assistance that the banking industry immediately offered up as soon as the pandemic hit, this is just a quick snapshot of um, some of the, the assistance that's been out there. There are loan payment deferrals. There is forbearance, which is a pause. And um, in your 
uh, loan payments. There have been interest rate reductions, fee waivers, increases in lines of credit as business, businesses and consumers need it, um, consumer loans, consultation, as well as refinancing and loan modifications. So let's move forward, please. Okay, so drilling down a little deeper into the federal um, mortgage relief that resulted from the CARES Act. As Bob mentioned, um, a borrower who is experiencing financial hardship with COVID simply needs to ask their mortgage servicer for that initial forbearance. So they get that initial period of up to 180 days, so that's six months, and then another 180 um, 80 days for a total of 360 days a year of forbearance upon request. So, um, and to be clear, forbearance is a pause or a reduction in the monthly mortgage. So they will have to pay that back. But importantly, the FHFA, which uh, regulates the government-backed mortgage providers, clearly came out and said that no lump sum will be required at the end of the forbearance. So the lenders will work with their borrowers on the way that they can repay that forbearance so that it best suits their financial needs. And perhaps that's tacking it on to the end of the loan or perhaps increasing the amount of the monthly payment. Um, you know, that is to be left up to the, the individual borrower's circumstances. And then at the bottom of this slide, you'll see a link. And if you have any constituents who have specific questions about what their options are under the CARES Act, this is a terrific reference with even some videos baked into it. So um, that's a handy resource. So if we could advance the slide, please. So, and then um, this is the federal foreclosure and eviction moratorium that has been extended again. So now this runs through at a minimum until the end of the year. So, and again, there's some um, online resources. So let's advance the slide. And then as Bob, he covered um, Governor Hogan's statewide uh, foreclosure and eviction moratoriums. So uh, continue today, there are no um, new foreclosures being filed right now. That's just, it's not possible to do that in Maryland. And again, some online resources. And then if we could advance another slide. Okay. And then the Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, has taken a number of steps to help they're very consumer facing. So again, if you have constituents with questions, and of course, sadly, anytime that there's an emergency of some kind, the bad actors just come out of the woodwork, you have these scammers. So these are links and resources that you can share with constituents that'll help them, whether they have a student loan payment question, whether they need assistance with their mortgage, um, if they're having trouble getting their stimulus check. So there's an array of information out there that can be helpful. And this is a nice one-stop shop. So let's move forwards. Okay, and then um, as Bob mentioned, as a part of that governor's announcement on April 3rd, he announced a number of Maryland um, lenders that are working with their customers in these specific ways, including 90 days of payments, uh, forbearance or deferral, waiving late fees, credit bureaus, and really all the banks are doing this. This was just a part of a formalized announcement. And let's advance the slide and thank you. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, a couple of important details, just I'll leave you with about the federal mortgage assistance is that um, the, the, it's very easy for borrowers to request that. They do need to be experiencing financial hardship as it relates to COVID. But once they submit that request, there's not documentation that is required to back that up. So it was really intended to be a streamlined process and we're hearing that's working well. In addition, if the, if the borrower was current when they went into that uh, forbearance, there, uh, there will be no negative um, dings on their credit reporting. Um, so that's important. And then in addition, there are no fees or penalties or anything like that attached to this mortgage forbearance. And I'm happy to take any questions you have. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Ms. Learman and uh, Mr. Etna. I think you, you'll note that there are a number of senators and delegates uh, and that you are in a Maryland General Assembly hearing and you've been invited to present. Um, so uh, we certainly, uh, I wanna thank, and, and, and so I wanna thank uh, Ms. Lehman for helping us understand that there are support for landlords that's out there uh, when they're not getting let, at least landlords that have mortgages. So again, uh, we're creating a context in which we are all in this together. Uh, we are working together to solve this issue, both for property owners, uh, for managers, as well as our tenants. Uh, and regardless of where the balance or imbalance 
uh, has happened in the past. Uh, this is a new day. So um, I want to, to also um, now transition uh, to Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition, um, and then also let you know that we are, are able to stay on for an extra 15 minutes so that we can hear everyone. Uh, some senators have other meetings, so they will have to leave. However, the co-chairs will stay and continue to have this. Also, those of you who are watching us live streaming, and then it'll also be available um, for, um, for review at a later time. So thank you. So now we'll go with um, the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition. Thank you, and I will try to keep this as brief as possible. Good afternoon. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, one more thing. I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, I saw in the chat, and I just want uh, people to hear, and maybe a DHCD to hear this. Um, we want to make sure that this information that was just provided by the Bankers Association, which was really very, very helpful, that it's well advertised, and if there's anything we can do to support you getting that information out there, um, and whether it's a PSA or something, um, I think that that's a great idea that this is indeed a PSA or commercial uh, worthy. So um, now um, on to MCRC. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Daria Brown. I'm the Student Rights Program Manager at Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition. MCRC works to ensure financial inclusion and economic justice to all Marylanders. Today, I'll be giving a brief update on what MCRC has been doing to help students in post-secondary institutions facing housing instability and other basic needs and security. As we all know, the economic impact of COVID-19 is greatly affecting students pursuing higher ed, specifically struggling with housing instability. MCRC has been working closely with other advocates to better understand and address students experiencing basic needs and security, either housing instability and or unreliable access to food, students experiencing homelessness and or foster care involvement are at high risk for basic needs and securities during college. In partnership with other, other advocates, we have created an institutional survey which asks um, Maryland colleges, private, public, two-year colleges about the resources that they've been providing for students, specifically asking questions about what housing um, initiatives they have for students experiencing homelessness and what housing resources they provide to students, as well as other resources. We are also going to be conducting student focus groups to understand what resources students have been accessing um, and um, just what resources they need to be successful. Um, additionally, along with other advocates, we've been looking at three legislative and policy solutions to address students um, facing basic needs and security. One um, would look at the problems we've seen with the unaccompanied homeless youth tuition waiver. Another would look at what the state can do to better support colleges efforts in addressing food insecurity. And then a third one would look at how colleges can better support students experiencing housing instability. Thank mm -hmm. you again for your time. Well, oh, I, thank you for your <laughs> brevity, but that's such an expansive topic, but we'll definitely follow up on these. Yeah. Um, next, um, the Women's Housing Coalition, uh, Beth Benner. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, I guess I have the advantage and disadvantage of going late in the schedule. Um, and I've been changing my presentation as I've been listening to other people. Um, so we're gonna go through my slides pretty quickly and I'll try to focus in on things that are a little different and then put in my uh, second vote for some of the other things that came up. Um, on the next slide, you're just gonna see something I stole from the United Way. 30 to 40 million people are facing potential eviction. Um, I wanna start housing people who are homeless. So we've gotta figure out how to stop creating more homeless people. Next slide. Um, that's because we have all this stuff going on with COVID and the flu season and all the ends of the various moratoriums. Next slide. Um, in Maryland alone, we have 39% um, of our population is living basically hand to mouth. Um, so when they have one economic or um, social instability, they are the next potential person experiencing homelessness. And with COVID and everything that's happening here, I look at my job and figure out how the heck are we gonna get through all of this. Next slide. Um, um, the people who um, 
not only need to get housed, but they need to figure out how to maintain their housing. And so for a lot of people who are homeless, it's not just the economic issue. It's also all the other traumas that have led to this and all the other instabilities. And um, as somebody pointed out earlier, if housing is the foundation of some of the basic needs people have, um, housing, safety, food insecurity, education, we've got to get that in place. Uh, next slide. Um, Availability is another huge problem. Affordable units, um, I once again stole this from the United Way, um, there's only three affordable rental units for every 10 Maryland families that need them. Um, we're an organization that serves 108 households at a time. We serve anybody, male, female, um, et cetera, but we specialize in women and families. Next slide. Um, one of the questions we were asked is, is vacancy the problem? And I'm gonna give you a very undefinitive yes and no. Um, when the units and the subsidies are available or people have income, we need to get them housed more quickly. Nicole pointed out all the, the specific hurdles of what's going on. I can tell you, I too have vacant units. Um, I had over 10 during the worst of the pandemic. And even today I have 14. Um, people are moving in, people are moving out, but we're not doing it fast enough. It's inspections, it's paperwork, it's um, the fact that, that so much of this money comes from the federal government and the state doesn't feel like they have the flexibility to do things. So we also need funding that can bridge us between um, when the federal money kicks in and when we can move somebody in. So if we could move somebody in physically quicker than the federal process allows us to do so, why can't we bridge that with state and local money? Um, and then the other thing is we also need to support people so they can maintain that housing. And as Nicole pointed out, um, that includes food insecurity, it includes um, mental health support services. It includes, um, we are not a rehab center, but we do a lot of, of, of substance use support groups to keep people clean and sober or to help them decide it's time to get clean and sober. We've been doing housing first for five and a half years almost. Um, and it's tough. Um, and as Nicole pointed out, we're also very restricted on what is the definition of homelessness because of our, our use of federal money. So if we could have some other flexible ways to serve people who don't meet those specific um, requirements until we get to the point of where the federal government will ease some of that language, that would be of a huge help too. But the no part of it is we need more affordable housing stock in general whether that's building new units or whether that's subsidies and you know building new units that lowers rents or whether that's subsidies that help support people afford units they normally couldn't afford. And we need to figure out a way to get income for people to support their basic needs. Next slide. Um, so in the specifics, we need to reduce those barriers of entry. And I went through a lot of those points already, so I won't repeat them. Um, and you can see that I'm really have laid out almost all the points that were made already. Next slide. Um, we need to keep people housed. You hear a lot about the revolving door, um, whether it's somebody getting emergency services grants and they get supports for six months and then they're facing homelessness again 18 months later, um, whether it's somebody who doesn't qualify be before, between uh, for emergency support services or permanent supportive housing. We need to get people into houses. We need to be able to work with them and we need to be able to help them gain the skills so that when they move out, I don't get to see them again unless they wanna come and volunteer here. Um, and so that's really important for us to be thinking about as we go through all of this. It is a roof over their heads. It is a pillow to lie your head down on but it's also how do you stay there? Next slide. Um, I will tell you that um, um, programs like ours and Nicole's and, and probably everybody else who spoke here, Scott, et cetera, we're starving for support services funding. Um, and the amount of time and energy I've seen that a case manager has to use with somebody um, has expanded significantly just in the six years I've been in this role. So it's, it's the caseloads are bigger and the needs of the individuals are greater. And so while our caseloads should be going down, they're actually going up. Um, 
And you need to give us more flexibility so that we can figure out what we need to do. We used to have a program where we rated all of our people um, on a scale of one to three. And the ones we only touched base with them, let's say once a month, and the threes we might have touched base with twice a week. We weren't allowed to do that anymore because the government, um, the federal government told us we had to have two touches to everybody. But if somebody's more stable and somebody's less stable, why shouldn't I be able to have the discretion of how to how to work with them? And then I guess I'm going to really ask that we get the business community much more involved in understanding that it is in everyone's best interest to have people housed, to have people being worked towards becoming more productive, more stable, et cetera. Next slide. Um, so what do we need? Obviously, you told us not to ask for cash, but we want more run subsidies. And we also want that to be different than what the federal government is doing so we can fill the holes. Um, as I pointed out, there's, there's two very strong federal programs. What happens to all the people that are in the middle of that? If you're not chronically homeless, as Nicole pointed out, and you can't get back on your feet in six months, how do we help you? Um, I think we should um, figure out how to make sure that as we're doing affordable housing through the low income housing tax credit, through other things, how we make sure that there's the money in there for the support programs. Um, how do we make sure that there's job trainings requirements that actually have some teeth? How do we incentivize um, the nonprofit developers to be the ones who are doing some of this housing building and going through that? Because in my mind, my job is to keep people housed, not just to keep units filled. And there's nothing against the for-profit developers who need to keep their units filled, but I will work with somebody much, much longer to keep them housed um, because my job is to get them housed and to get them stable. Next slide. Um, access to capital is a huge issue. Um, there's been no new funding models in, for building affordable housing in years. Um, I heard anecdotally, I don't know how much the numbers are exactly true, but um, I heard that you know less than 20% of the people who applied for home loans in the city of Baltimore um, were able to get awarded. And I heard that there were over 50 applications for low income housing tax credits. And they're thinking that 10 to 12 of those projects will get funded. Does that mean 80% of the projects aren't aren't valid, aren't solid projects that could go forward? Probably not. Um, and so I think what we need to do is think out of the box. Um, is there healthcare money? Because in my mind, housing is healthcare. We can save the healthcare system a lot of money if we can keep people housed and supported. But how, how do we do there? How do we get through some of this stuff? Um, that's what I, I, you know, I hope you guys can really think about and challenge. Next slide. Um, other people are doing it well. I recall a few years ago sitting through um, a continuum of care meeting at the city where they showed the, the dollars, the federal dollars versus the state and local dollars that were going towards homeless services. And they compared three or four cities and Baltimore City was you know, towards the bottom. I don't know how that plays out for state. I wasn't able to get that information, but I think it's important for us to think about you know, what are other people doing? And, you know, plagiarism when done appropriately is our friend. Um, so how do we do that? And then, you know, just one of the kind of off the wall things I was thinking about when I said get the business community involved. Businesses have, just like the hotels, um, they have vacant units. They have vacancy. But if they could give me two units for the price of one, they would still have a little bit of a vacancy problem. But I could take one subsidy and spread it across two people. So thinking about things like that, um, I love the idea that hotels are being used to help people, but that's not permanent. You know, keeping a family in a hotel room for any kind of more than a short term fix is um, not a good situation for them to be in. It's probably also more expensive than having them in an apartment and being supported by um, social service agencies. Ms. Um, Benner, like you wrap up. We still have a couple more people. These are all great. And okay, and that's it. I think that was my last slide. Okay. Oh, there we go. Good. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. Uh, now, I think we want to hear from Catholic Charities. Uh, Sue DeSantis. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you. Um, you know, it's been, it's, it's actually really advantageous to go towards the end because you can really hone in what you want to talk about after you've heard everybody and, you know, 
I would ditto so much of what people have said and different organizations have said about what the needs are right there right now from a funding and policy perspective. But I'll tell you what Catholic Charities has really been focused on um, during this pandemic. Um, you know, those of you who may not know Catholic Charities provide shelter, provides housing, food, workforce development services, and, and many wraparound services and foods. Uh, and I will make this brief, that includes uh, behavioral health services, substance abuse services, therapies, um, employment academy, day programming for homeless individuals. So we, we really do run the gamut of, of what is needed. And during this time, what we've been focused on is continuing those services during this pandemic. And we have not stopped doing any of what we're doing, although we've been doing it a bit differently. Um, you know, you know that our shelter, uh, the Weinberg Housing Resource Center, you know, all of those individuals were uh, universally tested and moved into hotels throughout Baltimore City. Uh, we also have sent folks over to the Lord Baltimore Hotel. And, you know, let me just say the work they're doing has been incredible, working with folks that are isolating, have been tested, waiting for um, results and incredible kudos to their work for housing individuals who are waiting on housing from shelter. Um, so we are doing this work, um, you know, continuing to shelter folks in, in new and innovative ways, whether it's putting folks in hotels or in some of our jurisdictions like Anne Arundel County, you know, also looking at having to decrease the number of people we're serving while those counties also offer hotel options for individuals. So that, that work has continued on. What we have really been seeing is a lot of food insecurity. Um, and we have had an incredible outpouring of food donations in our programs, uh, just unbelievable. So what we've been able to do is continue to offer meal services in these programs. Our Daily Bread, which pretty much everybody I'm sure has heard of, has continued its meal program. Um, My Brother's Keeper on the West Side, um, Sarah's House in Anne Arundel County, My Sister's Place, which is, you know, um, a homeless outreach program um, that allows for day programming for homeless women in Baltimore City. With all those folks combined, it's about 435 meals a day. In uh, At Our Daily Bread, the numbers are lower. That's strictly because we have um, the folks from the shelter across the street are now in hotels being served meals in their hotel. But the needs have still been there and we've been doing them without the volunteers that we have typically had. So this is with a small group of staff making sure this continues to happen. Some of the things that we thought would be helpful and we've implemented to try to address what we're seeing is, you know, access to benefits. You know, we've got what we know through the pandemic, a lot more individuals um, without, because of food insecurity, needing SNAP benefits. So we, in conjunction with um, Catholic Charities USA and Walmart were able to institute a, a hotline in Catholic Charities for individuals seeking SNAP benefits. So we instituted that, but it was supposed to only be in place until August 30th. We have decided as an agency to continue it at least to the end of the year. We've received uh, 1,621 calls. We've completed 247 SNAP applications, and we also have a bilingual component to that SNAP hotline, so it continues to be used and needed. Um, and then what I would also say has been a major focus that we have seen a, a great need is for new and innovative ways to do the workforce development. Um, individuals are not going to stay in the housing we're putting them in, not going to be able to maintain that without the ability to have some level of income, whether that's benefits or work. So what we've done through our workforce development and our daily bread and my brother's keepers, MOED, um, job hub, our virtual workshops now. We am linking people to our job placement specialists. So really having to meet people where they're at and doing things virtually and making it possible for people to access the virtual workshop. What's been really interesting is groups and um, organizations reaching out to us to say, can you do workshops around workforce development, job skill readiness for individuals that we're working with. So Amerigroup, which, you know, is an insurance provider, has asked us to do these workshops for their members. And so we have been doing job skill training. We've got two workshops, 40 participants, 19 Spanish speaking with the ability to translate, which has been phenomenal because then we can work with more individuals who are, are really suffering as a result of the pandemic, who are, are, are low income, who are in need, 
to kind of help them get into employment or back into employment because they've lost their jobs. The last few things I would say is, you know, we've received some funding to work with that 18 to 24 year old population through um, the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act. And we've developed a program called Level Up. And what's interesting is we'll be providing uh, homeless and low income youth with technical skills tracks in automotive, IT, or childcare, along with all those wraparound services that we offer, behavioral health, substance abuse services, food programs, workforce development in other ways, housing, so on and so forth. So we've continued to do all that we're doing, but in innovative ways. And if we've all had to look to do that, and I can tell you that the number one thing is an agency we definitely feel should be a pri priority and is a great need is addiction prevention and rental assistance. Um, in our Samaritan program, we are blowing through the money that we receive for that program. In our rapid rehousing programs in, in um, Anne Arundel County, same issue. We are seeing the numbers rise and we are very concerned about when the moratorium is lifted, what that will mean for the folks that we're serving and how many more individuals will become homeless. Um, so that, that really is our area of need. Um, and, and I think I really ditto what everyone has said as, as that being a, a critical need. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, by we'll wrap up now um, to uh, Ingrid Laughlin from the Housing uh, Homeless Persons Representation Project, and I think that's a nice transition um, uh, to her, the work that that she is doing, and that we. And then we still have healthcare for the homeless. We have two more presenters. Oh, okay. All right then. Sorry, <laughs> I got the abbreviated agenda. Okay, Ingrid. <laughs> Try to be brief. Thank you, uh, Chair Washington and Chair Valentino Smith. Um, my name is Ingrid Lofgren. I'm director of the Youth Initiative at Homeless Persons Representation Project. And HPRP is a legal services provider with a mission to end homelessness in Maryland uh, through direct legal representation, education, and systemic advocacy. Um, we have our main office in Baltimore City, but we also have an office serving Prince George's and Montgomery County. Um, so our service delivery model is to meet people where they are um, in the community where they're meeting their basic needs. So many of the locations where we hold our legal clinics have been closed during the pandemic. Um, we have continued to provide services. Um, so staff are mostly working remotely, um, both virtually and in person. We are representing clients in administrative hearings and in court. Um, particularly now in rent court, we're very focused on uh, eviction defense. Um, so we have continued to do outreach. We have focused on disseminating a lot of information um, to the community, to our client community and partners about various um, executive orders and uh, legislation resources that are available. Um, and um, as I said, now we're focused primarily on eviction defense and also on trying to help ensure that federal relief funds are administered equitably and effectively um, at the state and local levels. So for instance, um, in Baltimore City, Baltimore City has decided to really expand its uh, rapid rehousing investment through um, the Coronavirus Emergency Solutions Grant funding it's receiving. So we're working in partnership with the city um, and, and all of the rapid rehousing providers to try to quickly put some standard policies and procedures in place. So just in general, looking at you know, where the investments are being um, made or expanded very quickly during this time that we're, we're trying to ensure um, that that investment is going to be effective and, and equitable. Um, we also, like Catholic Charities, have seen um, really significant issues with food insecurity. Um, we do public benefits representation. Um, we also started a SNAP hotline during the pandemic um, to meet the um, exponential increase for requests for legal representation um, and assistance and benefits cases. We've had really good communication during the pandemic with the Family Investment Administration, and it's worked very well for us to be able to quickly elevate issues that we're seeing on the ground um, to FIA. Um, we are seeing some emerging issues with SNAP right now. Um, 
one issue is that um, we're seeing a lot of people getting terminated because of recertification of eligibility issues. Um, so we're seeing that particularly people experiencing homelessness are having um, issues with mail. Um, the mail has been very delayed. The service provider locations where they get mail may not be open or it may take longer for them to access. Um, they may be highly mobile. Um, and we've seen that improper notices are going out. Um, and then, you know, we're also seeing that people are completing the recertification paperwork, but there are a lot of delays um, and, and it's not being processed and they're getting denied and reapplying. And there are a lot of delays in their applications being processed. So this is something that we're addressing um, with FIA right now, um, but it, it's certainly an emerging issue. And um, we hope that you know, a lot of the flexibility that FIA has been able to exercise as a result of federal waivers will continue um, as much as possible beyond the pandemic. We've, we've seen that to be very effective. Um, and also with SNAP, I think the other main issue that we're still seeing right now is a lot of language access um, issues. And that's also something that we're working with FIA on, um, which has has generally been an effective um, partnership during the pandemic. Um, we're also really focused on criminalization issues, um, particularly you know, racialized criminalization of people experiencing housing instability and homelessness. Um, we're part of the People's Commission to Decriminalize Maryland. Um, my colleague is co-chair of the Homelessness Work Group and there's a whole range of issues related to criminalization that they're working on. Um, I'll just mention here that we are really hoping that local jurisdictions will not follow CDC guidelines and not disrupt encampments during this time. Um, and then my focus with HPRP is on our youth work. You've already heard from the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition about higher education issues. We are partners um, in that work um, and uh, very focused on those issues. We're also um, very concerned about funding for the Ending Youth Homelessness Act, which is administered um, by the Department of Housing and Community Development. So we know that this is a very tough year fiscally, um, but that funding is just so critical to meet the housing needs of youth and young adults under age 25. It provides flexible funding um, that local jurisdictions uh, can use to be really responsive to um, their particular needs for youth right now. Um, it also can be used to fund um, um, emergency shelter and housing for unaccompanied minors experiencing homelessness. We have a critical unmet need for that housing statewide. Um, and we're also very concerned about the moratorium on youth aging out of foster care being extended through the end of the pandemic beyond um, December. Thank, yeah. thank you, Ingrid. What we're gonna do is our third meeting too, we're gonna get more of an update on the unaccompanied youth bill and DHCQ will be before us. So send us those questions so we can make sure they answer it, especially on the funding. So I think last, what we wanna do now is hear from Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, yes, hi, um, I'm Kim Carroll. Thank you all for um, having me. I'm the coordinator for our case management department. So a lot of my information comes from the perspective of like groundwork, um, working with our homeless population. One of the main barriers um, we have identified during this pandemic is that um, we had one navigator for the entire Baltimore city um, to find shelter placement for our homeless clients, which is ridiculous. Um, we have clients filtering in daily looking for shelter placement. And we had one person um, to identify and trying to you know, find placement for our individuals. And a lot of times we're not always able to get you know, this particular person by phone. Um, recently, just what, two weeks ago, no, sorry, last week, 
we just got an update that the young lady is no longer the contact person is another person. And my understanding, she was the navigator for the entire Baltimore city. So all the agencies was contacting this particular person. So um, that creates, you know, um, trauma within itself when you have to tell um, an individual that's seeking help that, you know, we can't get anybody on the phone. So um, along with using the resources that we already had established, um, we would utilize those resources as well and sometimes have to, you know, go around that particular person. And a lot of times it led us to, you know, having to contact, contact this person anyway. So that, that has been a huge um, barrier in working through this pandemic. Um, in regards to coordinated access, which is another housing um, system that we utilize, that whole system needs to be modified. It needs to be reviewed. It needs to be modified um, because it creates so many barriers. I've been in this field for over 25 years. And what I noticed at one time before they um, streamlined everything through coordinated access for us to obtain housing for um, our homeless population, that a lot of those programs like Section 8, which is, of course, we know is no longer um, available, but um, a lot of the, the other programs, we were doing direct referrals. And with our case management department, because we have such a um, high advocacy group within our case management department, we could do a lot of follow-up. We can make sure, you know, um, be on top of when inspections happen, but we don't have any control over that anymore. So basically what we have to do is submit an application that goes through coordinated access and then people are not even eligible until they really can prove six to nine months homelessness. Now, how does that reflect our clients that are street homeless? Now for clients that are street homeless, what they are asking for is proof of somebody who have observed them in the street in order to qualify for coordinated access um, services. And, and that, that's inhumane. It's inhumane. Um, so in regards to, you know, addressing the issue, I mean, the pandemic, of course, really exposed more of this, but this has been going on for a while. Um, we do our best. I think we have a pretty good system. We have a lot of support at Healthcare for the Homeless because we do have um, the other disciplines, our medical, mental health, addictions, and everything that we can all work together in regards to providing the medical um, piece to all of this. But again, somebody mentioned something about basic needs, basic you know, um, human needs. When you don't have those things, it's really hard to maintain anything else. So you know, um, in regards to how to create these, you know, these housing resources, we got to look at the systems that we already have. Um, if we're going to continue to um, have these conversations and these meetings and trying to, you know, integrate new, new policies and things of that nature, we really got to tackle like what's, what's running. And it's, and it's very ineffective. It's not efficient. And um, I was talking to a colleague who asked me to present today. Um, I, I was so eager to come here today. Um, now I don't want to get emotional. I, I had a brother who passed away actually who suffered with schizophrenia and he um, went through this system of being street homeless. Um, when, when you have um, individuals who have chronic mental illness, it's very difficult um, as family to you, um, try to help, you know, you kind of disconnect and you, you rely on different systems like healthcare for the homeless, um, who, who does, I mean, outstanding work. I'm just so glad to be a part of, of, of this system. But again, the resources, is, it really don't make sense. Some of it do, but a lot, a lot of it don't. And um, we talk about the growing numbers. Well, this is why. This is why, um, because we can't forget the foundation work. I understand, you know, things become, you know, political and all those kind of things um, end up happening, but we, we, we cannot forget about the groundwork um, and that, um, 
when you have those complexities of mental um, issues, a lot of our clients, they have a difficult time. They really have a difficult time with follow-up. They have a difficult time. Like right now we have supportive services, which is an excellent, now that's an excellent idea because you have an array of, you have your therapist, you have your psychiatrist, you have your medical doctor, you have your nurse, you have your case manager and your peer advocate. So everybody is working collectively. A lot of our clients, once we get them housed in our programs, we immediately sign them up for rep payee because a lot of our clients don't know how to budget. Um, some of them have not developed those, those skills or they may suffer with like maybe addictions or um, you know, some other issue that prevents them from like paying rent on time and, and those kind of things. So um, I hear about the food. Um, food has been an issue as well, but there are resources out there and there have been community resources, but you have to be really, um, you have to be proactive in um, providing those resources for your clients. Um, our new uh, behavioral chief, uh, LaWanda, she had partnered with Merlin Food Bank. So we're, we were able to generate a food supply for our clients. So it was just a matter of being really, you know, proactive, um, going out there and reaching out to those resources. Then you had a lot of community resources that had food in different communities where um, we kept up with, at least on a daily basis. I had a case manager who checked into it like daily to make sure if, um, the food issue was addressed. But um, again, Thank just you, the whole housing piece. You know, that's, that's definitely been an issue. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Thank you. And, and, and you even bringing your own personal experience to it um, is, is very helpful. Um, I think we need to wrap up. Um, this has been an extremely informative um, presentation, I think, for all of us. I think we've been given a lot that we can work with with respect to recommendations um, and changes that the state can help with. I think we've heard loudly and clearly uh, with United Way having a 98% effective rate, uh, that case management and hearing from Ms. Carroll, case management's important. And I think a lot of us thought that that was the role of the state through DHS to be managing. So it's good to get these suggestions so that we can work with our state agencies on um, case management. For the next meeting, Senator, I think that what we're going to be talking a little bit about is adaptive reuse. There are, it, we believe there's a lot of occupancy out there um, already built that due to the pandemic now in terms of buildings and things like that. So rather than we know we need affordable housing, we're going to look at some adaptive reuse models. We're going to get an update on the unaccompanied youth legislation that we passed last year. We're going to hear from uh, Department of Housing and Community Development on not only the uh, existing grants and money that's been out there, but the use of the Federal CARES Act and the specifics with respect to how that's been used. We're going to try to get a little bit more information on total cost of healthcare and the healthcare system because we have this model of payment and how it can indeed work um, to assist us with housing and security and um, start to hear a little bit again, we did last year from the Department of Corrections with respect to what's happening with uh, re-entry. Anything else, Senator? Uh, our next committee hearing is November 4th. And again, thank you all for staying over. Uh, as you see, the members are all still here. We hear you, we're, we're partnering with you, and we look forward to really continuing to improve and end homelessness uh, in the state of Maryland. Um, take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.